Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of Making a Murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello folks, we're here today talking about another one of Zellner's experts. Today we're going to be talking about the DNA on the hood latch and the DNA on the Toyota RAV4 key. We're going to be hearing from um, Dr. Carl Reich. Uh, we're going to see his credentials here in a second. Um, but they're going to, we're going to go in, he's going to go into explaining why he believes that the evidence, the, the whatever they collected off of the hood latch is, is suspect and is in warrants further investigation. Mm -hmm. And also why the DNA that was found on the RAV4 key is suspect and warrants further investigation. So we're going to be going into that just for a few people out there um, that I noticed. Hey, look, you know, if, if you don't like the way that I read the documents, that's fine. I can understand that. Feel free to just pause them as you see them. Read them yourself. Skip ahead until you see the screen move. And you can skip through the documents and read them like that if you like. I, I, I totally understand if you don't like the way the sound of my voice, whatever it is, I'm it's I'm totally fine with it. So if you prefer to read the documents that way, you can use the pause feature and just skip through the documents if you like. Um, so, anyways, <laughs> having said that, um, I you know hope to eventually you know get back to school here pretty soon. I want to start taking you know courses, actual classes in criminal justice and and possible PI classes and things like that so no at this point in time I really only have my common sense and my ability to understand the words in these documents and understand what they mean and when they come together I you know I just have the ability to read them and understand them and see what's important um, so I just like making these videos because then it gives people a chance who maybe aren't as willing to spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes to read one of these documents who can more easily watch a video and get the gist of it. So that's, you know, I'm just basically trying to make all this information more available to everybody who might not otherwise have found the documents. At least they can see something of what's going on and what Zellner is saying in her filing. So that's my main focus, my main uh, goal here, folks. So here we go. We'll move right into it. Why should we listen to uh, Mr. Carl Reich, you know, PhD? Why should we listen to him? What's what's so special about him? Well, here we go. Let's see his credentials. I, Dr. Carl Reich, under oath and under penalty of perjury, state that I am a DNA analyst and professional molecular biologist. I have a doctorate in molecular, bi molecular biology and am a chief scientific officer of Independent Forensics of Illinois. Independent Forensics Laboratory adheres to the FBI's quality assurance standards for molecular biology, human genetics, and forensic DNA testing laboratories. Independent Forensics is accredited by ANSI, ASQ, National Accreditation, Accreditation Board, the American Association of Blood Banks, the New York, and the New York State Department of Health for Genetic Identity and Forensic DNA Testing. Independent Forensics is the only such laboratory in Illinois. Okay, so there's Dr. Reich's qualifications. Now, we're going to move into where he talks about the fact that the uh, they tested the swab that they were sent for item, um, for basically it was the uh, the swab of the hood, hood latch, what was left of it. And they tested it, and they determined that it basically was not, it was not saliva, blood, semen, or urine. It was not, none of those four bodily fluids. Okay, they were able to ascertain that. So... That means most likely it would have had to be skin cells of some sort. Okay. Skin cells would have been collected from anywhere on the skin, really. But to get large amounts, you have to like swab your, like your inside of your cheek or perhaps a groin area because, you know, you generally kind of have the, the general warmth of the area tends to create a little bit of moisture that makes it a little bit easier for some maybe some epithelial cells to you know get caught up on the swab so that would that's that's a couple ways where you would create an abundance of dna on a swab so 
Anyways, what he's what they're gonna get into here is that none of those fluids, none of those bodily fluids were found, and that they did a further some further testing to kind of see how much how much was it possible to to deposit on a hood latch, and the results are interesting. It is well documented that DNA was isolated from the listed item and is and this DNA generated a DNA profile of the defendant. The process of obtaining a DNA profile from a biological ex ex sample includes an obligatory step to determine, estimate the amount of recovered DNA. This step is called DNA quantification. The current method of DNA quantification uses a technique, quantitative PCR or qPCR a variant of the polymerase chain reaction. The documentation from the Wisconsin Department of Justice State Crime Laboratory, Madison, reveals that 1.9 nanograms of human DNA was recovered from the listed sample. At trial, it was claimed that the defendant's DNA on the listed item of evidence was deposited from sweaty fingers. This is, of course, pure speculation as there is no forensic test for the presence of sweat. Nonetheless, the DNA that generated the profile came from somewhere. In an attempt to replicate the findings reported by the Wisconsin Department of Justice State Crime Laboratory Madison, our laboratory performed a series of experiments on a vehicle identical to that impounded by law enforcement in this case. Volunteers were enlisted to open the car hood of this surrogate vehicle using the engine compartment hood latch, the latch that was then swabbed and a quantity of DNA recovered estimated by qPCR the current method used by the Wisconsin State Forensic DNA, DNA Laboratory, Madison. This experimental test was repeated 15 times. The hood latch was, of course, cleaned after each round and uh, an opening, and subsequent opening. The results of this test series is instructive. In 11 of the 15 replicates, no detectable DNA was recovered from the hood latch. In other words, the amount of DNA recovered after swabbing the hood latch used to open the vehicle was less than the minimum detection threshold of the qPCR method, less than 0 0.005 nanograms. In four of the replicates, quantifiable DNA was recovered with the following results. A 0 0.05 nanograms, a 0 0.09 nanograms, hey, that one almost got to 0 0.1, 0 0.06 nanograms, and 0 0.07 nanograms, which is important because the, the crime lab claims they got 1.9 nanograms from it. So, in other words, in almost three quarters of the hood opening trials, no measurable DNA was left behind by the individual who opened the hood. Put another way, even when DNA was left on the hood latch after opening the hood, the amount of DNA recovered was between 20 and 35 times less than that was recovered from the item identified as M05-2467 hashtag ID, which is the swab of the hood latch. To put it yet another way, the Madison Laboratory recovered from recovered from six to seven times more DNA than all of the DNA recovered from all 15 hood openings combined. Given the experimental results and both the fact the body fluid detection data and the DNA recovery data from the hood latch opening trials, the question of what sample M05-2467 hashtag ID really might be becomes a subject for investigation. Okay, this is Dr. Reich summing up what their testing was basically what it boils down to. For a variety of reasons, the forensic evidence in Wisconsin, Wisconsin versus Avery is being seriously scrutinized and re-examined. This includes the forensic DNA analysis conducted by the Wisconsin Department of Justice State Crime Laboratory, Madison. On item M05-2467 hashtag ID, the data obtained from the body fluid identification testing, from DNA quantification, and from DNA profile, and from, the att and from attempts at replicating the sample in question are contradictory. The data show an unacceptable DNA profile from a sample with no indication of a body fluid, a robust amount of DNA recovered from the sample, and yet attempts to replicate this finding failing repeatedly. These facts prompt a reevaluation of this evidence. So... What Dr. Reich did there was, number one, he pointed out that the, the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, when they tested the swab of the hood latch, they put it in the solution and did everything, and they got about 1.9 nanograms viable like DNA material, genetic material, okay? That's, that's quite a significant amount of DNA, okay? And that prompted them 
you know, because I, you know, they they thought that that was a high amount that they got, so they went a little bit further with this, and they went ahead and they got a a Rav four that's pretty much the same as Teresa's, and they had fifteen different people come up and open the hood on it, swabbed it after they opened it, swabbed it to collect the sample, cleaned the hood latch again for the next one to come up and open it. Did it 15 times, and 11 out of those 15 times, they didn't even get a registerable, it wasn't even enough DNA left on the hood latch to register in their tests. Okay, so how do we go from a task that that 11 out of 15 times doesn't even leave enough DNA to register? And yet somehow when Stephen Avery does it, he leaves 1.9 nanograms on it right yeah so you can see why this dna expert had a problem with it. it seems pretty clear that he was you know he saw that as a high amount and he was just like wow that's a lot of freaking dna and he just thought that he that uh, uh an experiment was in order so so dr wright continues raising his concerns the chain of custody and disposition of the two groin swabs taken from the defendant during his arrest is neither complete, accurate, or transparent. Such a sample, re relabeled as taken from the hood latch of the victim's vehicle, would satisfy all of the observed facts. Lack of body fluid. Sufficient amount of DNA for a profile that would link to the defendant that would link the defendant to the victim without all of the messy and complicated effort of actually depositing DNA on a greasy engine and greasy and grimed engine compartment metal latch. The convenience of this explanation and the fact that it accounts for the physical findings observed from the analysis of item M05-2467 hashtag ID does not prove evidence tampering, but more precisely evidence reassignment. But this, hip, this hypothesis is a far better fit to the data, experimental trials, and need of the investigation for clear and convincing evidence of a link between the defendant and the victim's vehicle. A swab, truly taken from the engine compartment hood latch, should have been covered in black engine grime and grease, as anyone who has ever had to open a hood of a high-mileage vehicle can attest. The swab batting in question was merely very lightly discolored. Another fact that does not fit with the claimed origin of this sample. Analysis of the bedroom slippers as possible source of the DNA on M05-2467 hashtag C, which is the Toyota key. Our lab conducted an experiment to examine whether the bedroom slippers <coughs> recovered from Mr. Avery's residence could have been the source of his DNA detected on the Toyota ignition key, M05-2467 hashtag C allegedly recovered from Mr. Avery's bedroom. This hypothesis was tested by creating a pair of worn slippers, sockless, nine hours a day for five days, and using this worn item as a source of DNA on an exemplar key, ignition key. The, proce the procedure was, was to prepare the slippers, rub the key, and then measure the DNA that was transferred, again using the qPCR technique. This approach yielded 0 0.0393 nanograms per microliter well below the concentration of dna reported by the wisconsin department of justice state crime lab madison for the key they analyzed m05-2467 hashtag c at 0 0.17 nanograms per microliter that's like almost six times more so that's significant these, these data do not support the hypothesis that the DNA identified on the Toyota ignition key came from the contact with the, came from contact with the slippers photographed in and recovered from Mr. Avery's bedroom. If the Toyota ignition key was indeed enhanced, then it is likely some other personal item of Mr. Avery's was used for this purpose. Some possible examples for that might be a toothbrush or a cigarette butt. Conclusion regarding the chain of custody. In order to account for the physical findings of body fluid identification, actually the lack thereof, because they didn't find any body, bodily fluids in the sample, of DNA profiling, of attempts at an evidence recreation, and of the physical condition of the item, M05-2467, hashtag ID. 
It is hypothesized that a rubbed groin swab taken from the defendant was relabeled and thus became evidence from a hood latch. This hypothesis has been has not been proven, but it fully explains all of the known facts regarding this item, taken into con- taken into context with the other facts and allegations in the case of Wisconsin versus Avery. This hypothesis deserves careful consideration from the trier of fact. Signed, Carl Reich. Okay, so to sum up with Dr. Reich, what we've got here is. The, the, the amount of DNA that the that the crime lab, the Madison crime lab claimed, you know, that they say is de- was deposited on there on that hood latch is so is so astronomically high compared to what the experiments they ran came back with, you know, barely registering point zero zero three point zero zero nine point zero zero six point zero zero seven. Okay, and the Madison Crime Lab has in their lab report that they got 1.9 nanograms. Okay, not in the point zeros, not in the point anythings. One, they had at least one full nanogram. 1.9, that's almost two. Almost two nanograms. And yet, when they run their experiments with people opening that hood latch, they were barely able to get only four four of the only four of the experimental openings actually registered measured by their equipment so that's significant and yet somehow when Stephen Avery does it well yeah he de- of course when Stephen Avery does it he deposits two mil- two nanograms are you silly of course he does it's Stephen Avery he's the idiot savant he's the you know, the one that's so idiotic that he leaves his blood all over the inside of the RAV4 and next to the ignition, but yet somehow it doesn't leave any of his fingerprints anywhere. Yeah. Idiot savant. Idiot savant. I mean, Zellner had that nailed in her in her introduction, in her, in this, you know, filing, this, you know, motion for post-conviction relief. So when she was going back and forth between Stephen the Idiot and Stephen the Savant, there was that was you know profoundly to the point so and i think that this this finding by this you know dna expert is equally so so we have that then we also have the fact that they don't like the fact that they tried to re- re- recreate the situation with the key of how the how the prosecution is saying that steven left his dna on that key okay without any of Teresa's being left on it. So so for some reason Stephen Stephen completely washes that key so that no DNA is on it, not his, not Teresa's or whatever. And then walks around with it for 15 minutes or so in his hand and deposits uh 0.17 nanograms of his DNA on it. And when the when when Mr. Ro- or Dr. Reich and his staff tried to recreate that they come up with a 0.03 nanograms get left on that key. Not 0.17 as the Wisconsin State Crime Lab apparently found on the key. So they're finding these discrepancies and then they're pointing out the fact that the chain of command on those groin swabs was incomplete, inaccurate, and not transparent. And so... All of these things together, combined with their experiments and the results of their experiments, and the and the 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 problem in the chain of custody, all these things culminate to to create this huge suspicion around the hood latch evidence and whether or not it can be taken seriously because they are basically coming right out and saying it that they believe that somebody may have switched a label so that. A groin swab became for it was basically supposed to be for comparison DNA or whatever correct okay but somebody switches the tags on it and suddenly it goes from being a comparison swab or whatever to becoming the hood latch swab and that's what that's what they're basically saying happened here and the reasoning is completely sound they've done the, they've done the work on it they've done the experiments the the reason their reasoning 
is completely sound. They're not saying that we have proof that this happened, but this is the one explanation that would explain why all these things, why, why all of the results came out the way they did. This would be the one explanation that pretty much would explain why those results are the way they are. So that's about it, folks. I love it. Zellner really, really went out and got some really good experts, and these guys are sharp. They are on top of it, and uh, I'm liking it. Looks good for Stephen and Brendan, uh, despite what you hear all the the guilters and everybody out there saying on Twitter and stuff like that. I don't. I think they're overstating it. I myself, I don't know how they could think that this is so easy to ignore. And, and the, the, the way that the test results came out way too high, much higher uh, amounts of DNA than they should have had, just all of it together all adds up to something's a little bit off here, fellas. So, hey, that's about it for this one. Uh, Dr. Reich and the DNA expert for Zellner. And uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. We'll see you later.